Welcome back. We're going to finish loading these cases up today. Only thing that remains is seating the bullets. But there's one entry that I haven't yet made in my log, and that's the right here. Cartridge overall length, COAL. I don't know what that I don't know what that number is yet. I do, but I'll I'll show you how I derive that number. Cartridge overall length is sometimes a, a confused matter. Um, the number that the number that is given in the book sometimes it'll it'll state a certain cartridge overall length number, and people will write in on blogs that they can't get that number because their bullets are too short or something like that. Well, first of all, the numbers are generally assigned to the, the particular bullet. In other words, if you look at the Sierra manual, it'll tell you the the cartridge overall length for a particular bullet. Uh, because it's already based, they already know it's based upon the length of that bullet. SAMI has established the industry standard for cartridge overall lengths for, you know, factory loaded ammo. <clears throat> I got to have a sip of water here. And that number, that number can be followed, and you can have, you can have very satisfactory ammo. And very often, if you if you've done all the steps that we've done together so far, you can have exceptionally accurate ammo, especially if you've turned the necks, and especially if you're uh, just neck sizing. These these have been neck sized, but they're not they're not fire formed. So when they go in the chamber, they're still going to sit rather rather loosely in the chamber, just like any factory ammo. So after they after they're fire formed, when I first test them, they're actually they're actually going to be better. Uh, they're going to be better in the future because the, the accuracy will improve by as much as twenty or thirty percent, just by just by having them fire formed to the chamber. But anyway, the overall length the overall length should be based upon the. You can either use the book the book value whatever it states in a loading manual. Or you can simply use the old standard rule of thumb, which the, the, the bullet shank, the bearing surface, not if it's a boat tail, boat tail doesn't count because that's not a bearing surface. But the shank of the bullet should be seated one caliber deep. So a 25 caliber bullet is a quarter of an inch in diameter. It means that the, the, the bullet shank should be seated into the case one quarter of an inch deep. That's ideal. Now that's the minimum. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean it's the maximum. The ma the maximum overall length can be more than that. You could have you can have a greater overall length. Uh, certainly with with very long bullets, you can be seated way down. You know, I could have that same 25 caliber rifle with the bullet seated down almost a half an inch into the case because the bullet is very very long. Um, and so I, I have to I have to base it upon whatever my my throat depth is, and at the very least the feeding mechanism of the rifle. If I'm using a magazine fed rifle, it has to fit the interior capacity of the magazine, and if it, whatever type of uh, action it is, it has to be able to feed. If I want to use it as a repeater, so all those things come into play, but. How you determine the seating depth for the utmost accuracy is something that a lot of people want to know. <clears throat> Sometimes the ideal seating depth cannot be achieved. For instance, if, if I take my Model 70 22 250, uh, there's, there's absolutely no way that I can seat a 50, a, a 50 grain bullet with a short uh, jump to the rifling. It's always going to have a long jump to the rifling. It's just the way the, the bullet is just too short to be able to seat correctly into the case. Um, but most rifles, you can you can you have plenty of latitude to seat the bullet out uh, to the to the seating depth that will achieve the greatest accuracy. Now, bench rest shooters, the people on the line who are competing for thousands of an inch, literally, you know, the thousands of an inch is the the guy who wins over the other one or the woman. They off they often very, very frequently, they stuff their bullets in with a bolt. In other words, the bullets, the bullets are overly long in the case, and when the, when the bolt is reefed down home, 
then the bullet is stuffed into the case as far as it needs to go while the bullet is, is matched to the rifling. And that gives them the advantage of having that bullet perfectly concentric down to the bore. They, they know that they, there's no yaw of that bullet whatsoever. When that bullet takes off, it's, it's going straight down the bore. And that's what they're trying to achieve. But keep in mind that that, that brings along with it the typical consequence that they suffer sometimes. If the horn goes off and they haven't finished firing, you know, they, they open up their bolt and quite frequently they, they leave a bullet stuck in the rifling and the hand goes up and the range master comes over with the range rod that he carries. He walks the line with the range rod because he knows that somebody's gonna be, somebody's gonna be putting their hand up and they're gonna say, I'm stuck. So they tip the gun upside down, everything, everything falls out. They, they peel the case back. It happens to them all the time. It's rather routine. They peel the case out. You know, a little bit of powder is left in there. They shake it out and they don't have a magazine box for everything to get trapped in, so it's, it's pretty clean. And then the range master just runs his rod down through it and they, they pop out the bullet. That's certainly not the nonsense you want to go through for your own hand-loaded ammunition because, you know, if you're out in the field away from your bench and everything, you're going to have a real mess, especially with a hunting rifle and a magazine and the trigger mechanism and all that stuff. It's, it, it's not the way to go. So you need to bring your bullet back from the rifling. If you bring it back just a little bit, it's not going to be enough because what's going to happen is due to the elasticity and the variations from one load to another, you're going to have some bullets that are going to be, you know, two thousandths of an inch away and some of them are going to be one thousandths of an inch away. They're going to vary. That, that certain amount is going to vary tremendously. Most manufacturers, you know, most uh, bullet manufacturers will recommend that you seat their bullets to, you know, like Nosler, for instance, to between 15 thousandths to 30 thousandths of an inch back from the rifling, the, the, the lead, L-E-A-D-E. -E. And that's the tapered section of, the, the rifling starts out, as, it's not abrupt, it starts out as a tapered ramp. So you're seating, you're, you're actually, you're actually, the bullet is actually inside the rifling, but where the engagement part is of the ogive, where, where it begins to, to form a shank, Right there, the tapered section of that rifling is beginning to contact it. In my personal experience, 20 thousandths has always worked pretty good. Um, I, I've, had, I've had no problem at all. If I, if I have a brand new rifle and I'm making it my first loads for it, I seat 20 thousandths, 20 thousandths of an inch deep from the rifling and I have terrific ammo. Uh, if I want to putter around a little bit and, and seat a little bit farther out or a little bit, you know, if I, I can start from maybe, you know, 15 thousandths and I can work, I can work up to 25 thousandths. You know what? I'm, I'm almost always somewhere around 21, 22 thousandths, 19 thousandths, something like that. It's almost always 20 thousandths works. So that's a good guideline. How you derive that computation is not as difficult as most people think, and it certainly shouldn't involve purchasing anything. You don't need to buy a gadget with a dial caliper in order to, in order to do that. All you need is, is the dial caliper. That's, that's sufficient. That's all you need to have. You don't need to have any attachments for it. You don't need to have any gauges. You don't need to have any kind of instruments beyond that whatsoever. Um, and it's, you can even do it. You can even do it another way. Um, with most with most rifles, you can. You can't do it with the horn or the interlock bullets because of the way they're constructed. They have that secant ogive, and a secant ogive. If you want to take a look at it, it's it's kind of it's got an abrupt it's got an abrupt shoulder. It's not a curved it's not a curved ogive, and that abrupt shoulder gets wedged into the rifling and gives you a false reading. So it, it will, what I'm going to describe is that with some, with some rifles you can simply take a round which has been seated into a, an, an empty case that has been sized and have the bullet seated uh, about two-thirds of the way in and then simply bring the bolt forward and then stuff the bullet into the, into the rifling and close the bolt and gently pull it back. Usually with, with, usually with a clean bore, that bullet will pull back out without any difficulty. Because you're using a, you're using a case which is not loosely sized, it's, it's fully resized. So that's got a firm, firm contact. You can, 
you can color the bullet shank so that you know if the if the case has been drawn back and that's not a bad thing to do but when you when you draw it back all you have to do is put it into your loading press and bring your bullet seating stem die on die down onto that bullet and from that point on you can calculate how many thousandths of an inch by turning the die now that's one way and how much you how much you turn that stem is based upon it's based upon the number of threads per inch that you have on your seating stem now i'm going to i'm going to talk about a different way of doing this too but for instance if you're using um, if you're using rcbs seating stems rcbs dies it's 28 threads per inch if you're using Lyman dies, it's 20 inches, uh, 20 threads per inch. Lee, this says 18. I don't get that measurement. That might have been older Lee dies. Um, I, my count is I get I get uh, in a quarter in a quarter of an inch of threads. I get uh, five threads. So that's that's 20. Uh, that's 20. The same as Jones and Hornady and Hollywood are 18. Forster and Bonanza. If you got 25 caliber or more, is 28. I'm going to post this so you can see it. Dylan is 20 threads per inch. Now, anybody who understands how micrometers work, let's see if I have one here. Anybody who understands how a micrometer works is you got the barrel here and the barrel is is mounted on a uh, stem that has 20 uh, 40 threads per inch so each one of those each one of those full turns represents 25 thousandths of an inch so if i if i unscrew it 40 turns that means i have one inch that's that's how that's based well your your seating stems have a different your seating stems have a different number but it works the same way I'm going to tell you how to compute it for your for yourself and how much those graduations are. And this is why you don't want to be going out and buying stupid pricey pricey things like you know vernier vernier seating stems and all that. It's, it's, it drives me nuts when I see this stuff. People are paying good money to buy something they don't need to buy. Um, all you have to do is put a mark on the end of your put a mark on the top of your seating stem. This is the seating stem right here. You just put a, put a mark on it any place at random. And you can see when you've made a full turn or when you've made a quarter of a turn or half a turn or whatever. Anything less than a quarter of a turn isn't going to mean much of anything to, in most, in most uh, dies. Um, determining the thread, the, how many turns for each thread pitch is very simple. If I have, for instance, a uh, RCBS seating die, it's 28, it's 28 threads per inch. So all you have to do is open your trusty calculator on your uh, smartphone and type in 1,000. That's how many. That's how many thousands there are in one inch. We're basing this on threads per inch, so we're, we're, we're going to be converting it to thousandths of an inch. You can do this with metric, too. You can do this with centimeters and, and uh, millimeters. But we're, we're talking about inches now, so we type in 1,000, and then we divide that by, what did I say, 28, divided by 28. And that means that each turn, each, each turn of that, that uh, stem will equal 35.7 thousandths of an inch. In other words, 30, 35 point set, we'll call that 36 thousandths of an inch for each, for each turn of your, full turn of your seating stem. A half a turn would be halfway around, so you divide it by two. Divide it by two, and that equals 17.8, we'll call that 18. That's pretty close. To, so a, a, a half, a, just a tiny bit more than a half a turn with an RCBS seating die when you put the when you put your screwdriver in that slot in the top of the seating stem 
you're going to get twenty thousands. That's all there is to it. It's it's the simplest thing in the world, and you don't need to have you don't need to have vernier numbers on the side of that uh, dial. Let's do another one. If you have um, if you have uh, let's see, Lyman is twenty. So we'll type in a thousand divided by twenty, and that comes out to a even number of fifty thousandths of an inch per turn. So fifty thousandths of an inch. If you want to only, if you want to go uh, just a, a fourth of that, so you divide that by four, by uh, divide it by four, and that equals that gives you twelve, twelve and a half, twelve and a half thousandths per quarter turn. So again, if you want to double that and and go, you know, a little over twenty. Thousandths of an inch, it'd be 24, 25 thousandths of an inch, just go a half a turn. It's the simplest thing in the world. So don't waste your money on nonsense like that. That's my, that's my, uh, <laughs> that's my rant for the day. But I'm going to take you over and show you how I like to measure overall length and the, the, the way that always comes out absolutely perfect. So let's go over to my workbench. So Everything that you need to make a precise measurement of your chamber length for the given bullet. Now, this has to be done for individual bullets because ogive uh, taper and shape will, and, and the meat plat design, everything will affect the uh, chamber length measurement that you derive from this. So, but this, this will work for individual bullets and once you have this measurement, as long as you use the same type of bullet, you'll always be, uh, you'll, you'll always be good. So all we have is a, uh, a blunt tip on a uh, cleaning rod. Alternatively, you could simply get a brand new uh, hardwood dowel that will fit down your barrel. That's perfectly appropriate too, but you need to have a blunt tip. You can't have a uh, open tip on the end of that cleaning rod because, uh, or, or a uh, pointed tip, anything that would give you a false measurement. You need your calipers and you need a bullet, the bullet that you're going to be loading, and uh, scotch tape. Now I've upgraded my process. Uh, I'm always working to uh, improve things as I go along, and uh, I've added an X-Acto knife, and I'll show you what that's all about. And uh, of course, I've got the uh, gun mounted in a, solidly mounted in a vise here, and uh, let's proceed with this, with the first measurement. With this blunt tip, you can see this, it's uh, nice and smooth on the end. You can even make one from an old cleaning jag, just uh, file off the end until it's perfectly uh, flat. It's got to be square. Uh, insert that carefully into your uh, crown so you don't bang anything up. There's nothing there to bang up. That's all soft brass and aluminum. And I'm running that to the bolt face. When that contacts the bolt face right there, that's what I want. Now this is where I've modified my technique. Before I applied the tape right at the uh, right at the junction right here. In other words, I applied the scotch tape in a previous video, just like that, to get a measurement. This way, uh, sometimes you can have variations in how that tape might fold over when you're applying it. So instead, I'm I'm just simply going to pull this out uh, where my thumbnail is. I'm going to apply the tape right there. You can leave a flag on the end of it so you can cut that off with your uh, knife afterwards. I'm going to reinsert that back into the barrel. Now you notice that the tape is being buried inside the barrel. This is where your this is where your X-Acto knife comes in. I don't want to damage my cleaning rod, so I'm going to place the knife. This knife won't this knife won't fold over like tape does. So I'm just going to place the X-Acto knife there and I'm going to make a light tick mark. Just going to check and see that I can see that tick mark. I'll do it again just to make sure I have it deep enough without cutting into my beautiful cleaning rod. And once I have that marked, I can clearly see it. And uh, now I'm going to take that cleaning rod out. I'm going to mount a bullet inside the chamber. Simply remove the bolt. And now you have to uh, 
invert the gun like this, muzzle down, and just simply drop, drop the bullet in. You might have to, here it is. I just shook it and it went down into the chamber. So now I'll take a, uh, a cleaning rod and I'll put it against the back of that bullet. You can use a short length of dowel or you can use this type of, uh, or you can use a pistol cleaning rod, whatever will reach that bullet. It doesn't have to be the uh, full length cleaning rod. I've got, I've got a clean, this is a, this is a chamber cleaning rod. It doesn't have a swivel shaft on it. And I can put that into the uh, receiver and uh, behind the bullet, and I'll hold that bullet firmly into the rifling. I'll take the cleaning rod, insert it in. This time, I'm holding that I'm holding that chamber cleaning rod in, so I don't dislodge the bullet. And once again, I'll put another piece of tape that will be buried inside the barrel. So I mark the location approximately with my thumbnail, apply the tape right there, and uh, I'm going to put that back inside the back inside the barrel, holding that bullet in place. I push that bullet firmly in place at the same time that I put a tick mark. First of all, I locate the tick mark on the other piece of tape, so I put it in the same location the same uh, part of the radius. And I'll use the same technique, apply that, apply the exacto knife right there. Don't use a big knife, a hunting knife or something because they have a bevel that's gonna change your, that's gonna change the way that uh, that is angled. So I've got two tick marks, one from there and one to there. Getting my chamber measurement is as easy as taking my calipers and measuring from one tick mark to the other. That's all I have to do. And uh, I don't need to have any expensive gadgetry. This is exact and precise as it comes. I could put, put the tip of my calipers right on that tick mark and go right up to the next one and put my calipers and right there, exactly. I've got the precise measurement right there. Check it out. Make sure I've got my points aligned. It's hard to do it while I'm trying to focus this on the camera. So right there, I've got uh, my actual measurement from point to point is 3.245. Now I remeasured those tick marks because I was I was looking at things from an angle trying to get it into the camera. I came out with a measurement of 3.225. So simply 3.225 and minus 0 0.020, 20 thousandths of an inch. Naturally it's 3.205. So that's what we're going to mark down in my ledger. So with that done, we can proceed. If you might want to know what uh, 20 thousandths of an inch represents, it's basically five sheets of 20-pound uh, printer paper or seven sheets of uh, lined uh, high school paper. So anyway, we're going, to take, we're going to take our first case. I've already checked them to be sure they're all charged with... Uh, powder. I'm going to back my seating stem off several turns. I don't want to uh, I don't want to seat that bullet all the way in so I'm going to back it off about three turns or so and run that run that bullet home. Now we're going to take the calipers and measure that measure that length. I know that that's going to be way long, but just see how far we have to go. We have uh, 3.330 here, so, and let our seating stem do the work. So we have 
3.330 minus 3.205 equals 125 thousandths of an inch. So I recomputed my seating stem turn equivalents and I recalled that it was 50 thousandths of an, 50 thousandths of an inch travel per single turn and I've got to move it 125 thousandths to close the gap. So basically I have to turn my seating stem two and a half turns. Basically it's, a, it's 125 thousandths divi divided by 50 thousandths. So we'll just go, we'll go two and a quarter turns. We'll go two, two turns and see what we end up with. I've got, my, I've got my witness mark on the top here. I'll turn the camera up so you can see. I've got my witness mark on the top here, so I'm gonna turn that, closing it down by one, two, and we'll put that round back in. And if my if my measurements of those uh, if my calculations of those uh, thread pitch are correct, I should be almost home. That should be about twenty five thousandths shy, and it certainly is. I've got. See, I, I wasn't using any vernier scales or anything like that, and I came within I came within uh, just six thousandths six thousandths of an inch. So I've got uh, three point two one nine. So we need to close that up just a little bit, a little bit more. We want three point two oh five. Give it just a slight turn. From this point on, don't don't rush it. You want to get the number that you're seeking. There we go. I got 3.204. That's close enough for me. 3.204, 3.205. That's plenty close. So. That's my seating depth. If I want, I can back that off a little bit, but I want them all to be the same, so we're gonna just leave them the way they are and finish seating all those bullets. Make sure you keep your cases if you're working with multiple lots don't mix them at this point don't uh, don't get carried away and turn your block around keep your block oriented so that it's always facing in the same direction and you don't mix up your uh, lots and as soon as you complete charging one lot I would recommend that you transfer that lot to a uh, box and uh, label the label each column in the box now, should I crimp them? For maximum accuracy, I would recommend not crimping them. Uh, if we're, we're not doing we're not doing auto loading stuff here, and we're certainly not doing anything for uh, lever action rifles, so we want to have the utmost accuracy. So you want to leave these uncrimped, and that way there you have uh, you have the least disturbance of your uh, the entire mechanical aspect of the uh, ammo will, will remain uh, very true. So there you go. It's oh so easy. You don't need to buy any expensive contraptions. You don't have to line somebody else's pocket when all you need to have is a piece of tape and an X-Acto knife. And if, if that's, you know, if you really want to do it without a cleaning rod, you can just get yourself a dowel of the appropriate diameter, say a quarter inch dowel, run that down the bore and uh, use the same X-Acto knife and make a tick mark on the, on the uh, hardwood dowel. That works too. So no matter what you do, it's all the same. But uh, don't spend any more money than you have to. I mean, things are expensive enough without, uh, without spending frivolously. And I showed you how to make adjustments on your seating stem, which are precise, I mean, dead on. I mean, uh, you know, just as, I, just as I showed you, you know, calipers and you know, 
micrometers are based on how many threads per inch. If you know how many threads per inch your seeding stem is, then you can easily calculate the uh, amount of thousands per turn or per half a turn or quarter of a turn. Simple as that. Remember, just take a thousand and divide it by whatever the threads per inch. And uh, that gives you the full turn, and dividing that by two gives you a half a turn, dividing it by four gives you a quarter turn, and all that stuff. Very simple, so easy to do. So we'll get, I'll get it, these, these all seeded, and uh, as soon as we have some halfway decent weather that I can go out, I can't go out when it's in the 30s and the wind is blowing and, and trying to concentrate on shooting. It just doesn't work. I mean, the wind chill factors are just too bad. So uh, we, still have, we still have a good amount of snow, and last night we got another quarter of an inch. It's, it, it's gradually fading. But um, I thank my Patreon donors for all your support, and uh, it's been tre tremendous to, to help you know, keep me going. And as, you know, as the summer comes in and I can do more shooting, that, that's the sort of thing that will help me to buy ammo, that I can shoot different rifles and uh, handguns and things. So don't forget to subscribe. Hit that subscribe button right now and hit the bell so you know I'm around. Thanks for watching. God bless.